started on me before I got fully uh, set up this morning, so I'm all set now. So um, thank you so much for um, to Amy and Esther and everyone for inviting me here this morning. Um, so I don't. I live in uh, Brookline, near to Boston. I don't get out to New York very often, so it's, uh, it's nice to get out here and to see this beautiful church, and to to to, to start to meet uh, some of you folks. Um, I'm thankful for the opening remarks by the bishops. They seem to have done half of the work that I thought I was going to need to do, uh, giving you, I think, a, a real sense for. Uh, what this work, uh, what this organizing, what faith is all about in this work. So, um, so that's great. Um, I thought I would just start briefly with my uh, my own introduction to the world of, of uh, organizing and faith communities. I'm going to sometimes use the word faith-based organizing uh, because I believe much of this organizing does draw upon and roots itself in faith traditions and faith communities and faith institutions. It extends beyond that, and people use a lot of other kinds of words uh, to describe it. But I was a graduate student at Harvard University uh, trying to decide what to write my dissertation on. And I spent a semester sitting in a room with no windows, staring at four walls, you know, scratching my head, tossing out one idea after another and scratching, scratching those ideas off and getting more and more depressed. And believe me, that's a very common uh, disease among PhD students, I, I learned later. And uh, one day, my advisor came back from a trip to San Antonio, Texas. And she said, I have exactly the project for your dissertation. I've been visiting the Industrial Areas Foundation network in, in Texas in the Southwest. A man named Ernesto Cortez has invited me down to give a seminar uh, to their organizers and leaders. And uh, she said, you're very interested in how, uh, what's happening in our political system, that our political system is broken, that regular people don't seem to have a role anymore and don't participate and build power in our political system particularly in communities of color, but also in white communities as well. You are interested in issues of, of racism and social justice, and is there some way to bring people together in our country across racial lines? How do we, how do, we do that? And so I got on a plane, and I went to El Paso, uh, Texas. I'd never been to the state of Texas, so the idea that I was going to do my dissertation research in a state I'd never even been to before was a little bit audacious, I suppose, but since I was at Harvard, I guess we do a lot of things. She said, I'll help you get some money together, and you know, I could stay, probably stay at rectories in different places, uh, maybe for free while I did it. So anyway, I ended up in El Paso, and uh, the day I arrived was going to be one of their, their 10th anniversary uh, <clears throat> assembly. And I got, they invited me to come to that, the first thing I did, and I got there and I stood outside and I watched bus after bus arrive, and hundreds and hundreds of people arriving from their, their churches and sometimes from their schools and other places. And uh, it was a very powerful experience, because I don't think we have many of these uh, opportunities, many of these vehicles, as the bishop called them, um, in which you will end up with a thousand people gathering together to talk about the issues that are facing their community. And up on the top of the stage wasn't just um, political leaders, wasn't just you know, executive directors of organizations, it wasn't just bishops, although they were all there. Um, it, was, it was regular people from these congregations or these Catholic parishes getting up and running the show and making decisions and engaging with the political leaders of their community. And the other thing that I saw there, which I think um, so it was about building power, and they were talking about uh, water services to colonial areas. They were talking about the state of education and their plans for improving education. It was about building power to make change for social justice, but it was also about bringing people together in a different kind of way. It would, uh, because there were people there, lots of folks from uh, Mexican-American parishes, but there were also people from across the metropolitan area, across lines of race. There were many. Uh, white and, and African-American people there also. And so it was a different kind of an environment. Um, and it was clear that it was built on a different kind of relationship, as the bishops were talking about. So it was about power, it was about relationships, but it was also, in the end, to me, about people having the opportunity to develop themselves as public actors in a full way. People who maybe didn't have a lot of other opportunities in their life to, to develop their own leadership skills. 
and, and stand up and, and help, uh, help themselves and help their communities. So anyway, uh, it was a very powerful experience. I went around to write my dissertation on this network and what we could learn from it in terms of how to organize. I wrote a book called Dry Bones Rattling um, from that, and I, I learned a tremendous amount and changed my life in many, in many, many, in a fundamental way. And I've been on a journey that was 20 years ago, maybe a little more than 20 years ago, and I've been studying and working with uh, organizing groups in faith communities and other ways, uh, other ways too, since then. And I wanted to give you a sense uh, maybe off of that story, that uh, this is a movement, if I can call it a movement, uh, that has very deep historical roots. Uh, so we're giving examples, we've heard examples now over the last 20 years, but it really goes back at least to the work of Solovinsky in Chicago uh, in organizing in the 30s. It, it, we can talk about it going back earlier as well. We can bring it to the abolitionist movement. We can look at settlement houses. We can talk about all of these traditions that have involved <clears throat> faith communities and issues of social justice and racial justice in our country. But it certainly uh, has a clear, uh, in terms of a codified way of organizing, starting with Solvinsky. And then um, we have the Civil Rights Movement and Martin Luther King Jr., which, is, which really, I think, in, emboldened and in, in freshened and deepened uh, the connections of organizing to uh, the African American community. Um, and then we have it continuing on in so many ways today. And we're, I'm going to talk about a few examples. We, we've heard mention of the Industrial Areas Foundation. We've heard mention of PICO, the Pacific Institute for Community Organizing. But there's a broad way, array of ways that I think people are working around this. And continually, it's, it's not the dead story. It's not something that happened 50 years ago. So it's continually reinventing itself for the contemporary demands. So it's about deep faith traditions that go back millennium. But it's about the engagement of those traditions with the contemporary realities that we face in our country and in our world. And so it's an ongoing story about how do you uh, and how do people bring those traditions and make them alive for the, 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 uh, the challenges that we face today. Um, <clears throat> So, um, if you will, I would say that um, <clears throat> this movement really, uh, the contemporary version of this movement really got going uh, again in the, in the 70s, fueled by Alinsky's earlier work, fueled by the Civil Rights Movement. And uh, we started to see this field of, of organizing growing. Um, I was happy to work with Interfaith Funders, a group that tried to study the field and collect some information about it. By the way, this is a... This is uh, some, just some pictures from the uh, 1LA, which is actually an Industrial Areas Foundation organization in, in Los Angeles. Um, and in 2012, Interfaith Funders did another seri uh, survey, found about 200 uh, organizing groups within this particular tradition um, active in 40 states. There were about 3,500 uh, faith congregations of, of all sorts. I'm using the word congregations, but that would include uh, mosques and parishes. Um, involved in this effort. Um, not just uh, congregations, though. Uh, there were about a thousand public schools that were involved, many labor unions, neighborhood associations, and a range of other kinds of uh, faith-based organizations. And through these organizations, the movement uh, uh, collectively was uh, reaching and representing over five million Americans. So even though uh, many people only know one particular organization, um, like if we were looking in Boston, we might point out the Greater Boston to Faith Organization, there's actually a very large movement across the country. Um, I don't, I'm talking mainly about this kind of organizing, but we also know that there are other ways that organizing is happening, not quite in this faith-based model. So if you want to extend it beyond this, we're probably talking about something that is at least two or three times its size. Um, the other, uh, I think, very important uh, part about this um, movement, if we compare it to other kinds of political organizations or civic organizations in our country is that it's, um, <clears throat> it's very diverse along faith lines, along racial lines, along social class lines, along end of immigration status. And I have uh, a colleague of mine, Richard Wood, who spent a lot of time looking at this and has been arguing that this is clearly our most uh, diverse form of civic and political uh, organization in this country. And we need to value that and, and think about that because we simply do not have very, very many of them. And I'm going to return to that. And it's also very diverse amongst the kinds of faith communities. I'm not going to get into the statistics, but, you know, at its core, 
I would say that there are um, African American Protestant denominations and churches, more mainline, more whiter, if you will, uh, denominations, and uh, Catholic churches. But beyond that, we have many Jewish synagogues, mosques, and a whole range of others that are involved. So it's, it's really quite diverse. And if you would, and he has looked at the compositions of the uh, steering committees or executive committees and has argued that it's the most diverse set of leadership bodies that we have in our political life right now. So, um, <clears throat> um, I think about uh, community organizing and the role of faith communities in, in a couple of different ways. I think it's about uh, building power to make change, but I think it's also about uh, building, if you will, uh, the, our, our institutions, our, our faith communities, um, but, it, but let, it's certainly about building power to work for social justice. And I was going to give an example from uh, this group called uh, People Alive for Communities Together in San Jose. Um, and I think I'll, I'll do that, but let me do that. Um, these are all kinds of examples. I'm going to put this up to, to, to talk about it because I think it might be a little bit more helpful. So um, I don't think I can take this off of here. But, um, this is uh, an organizing cycle that uh, representation. Can people see that? Okay, sure. Yeah, um, by uh, that's put, put out by the Pacific Institute for Community Organizing. So that is one of them. But I, I, I think that it's very helpful to think about it this way. So uh, what's involved here? Can I, does this come off? Or no? I'm feeling a little stuck here behind this podium. Or maybe people can hear me. Okay, great. I feel a little more comfortable. Uh, I can walk around. Okay, so. Um, what this cycle is talking about is that really you might you could start anywhere, but let's start on the one on ones. Okay, so what's really I'm, I'm okay like this. I, yeah. I think I'm, I'm walking around a lot. Thank you very much. Um, that really at the heart of what this uh, organizing is about is about building relationships between people. It's where people come together to share their stories and to make a connection with each other that is deeper and richer and more meaningful than the kinds of just friendships you might create somewhere else. Because the context for this is, I want to tell you what has brought me into this setting, into this organizing, my own faith values, but my own personal experiences in my life. What is my story? Why am I here? And that's very, very important, that everybody is not here uh, perhaps just for altruism, or we might have altruism, but we have a personal story about why we have come to this room today, why we are interested in this conversation, why we are willing to reach out and meet with people who are very different from us. And it's through building those relationships, talking one-on-one, -on -one, that people create the kinds of a foundation to work together in the, in the public world, um, if that makes sense. And um, through these one-on-ones, people also start to talk about the kinds of issues that are affecting them in their lives. So um, in San Jose, uh, California, the organization there, PAC, that I was referring to, was uh, concerned about the state of public education. It, start to, it started to bring parents together in East San Jose to talk about what was going on in education. They were talking about their faith values, they were talking about their personal stories, but they were also talking about their experiences, the experiences of their children in the schools. And this is very important because what happens for many people when, uh, you know, if, if your child, if my child is not doing very well in school, then I think it's something's wrong with my child or something's wrong with my family. But if I start to meet one-on-one, -on -one, if I start to meet in house meetings, and I, it finds out that all the parents have a very similar story about what's happening with their children in uh, some very poor communities in, in East San Jose, then we start to realize that the problem isn't our personal problem, it's a systemic problem with what's happening with the education system and the lack of power that our community has. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's a fundamental transformative process that organizing uh, creates for people. And now we can start to talk about, well, what is it in our, that's wrong with our schools uh, that's creating these kinds of problems? And then we see the next, uh, so we've, we've talked about relationships, we've, we've surfaced issues if that's the way, but we've talked about our faith, we've talked about the real issues facing our communities, and then uh, we're sort of listening and learning, I think you can see that too well, but then there's a phase about uh, research. 
So what happened in San Jose is that the parents that were organizing, it, at the core it was a, a group of, of Latino parents in East San Jose, but as we're talking about, these organizations cross lines of class, of race, of faith. And so the larger organization was a much more diverse organization. But at its core was uh, Latinos' parents whose children were at the school, and they started to study. Uh, they, they traveled to other cities to look at schools that were working better for low-income Latino children. Um, this is a very important part of what we might also talk about as leadership development. So these folks were learning, they were growing both about how to be public actors, but also about how to do research, how to be able to be knowledgeable actors in the public realm. Um, and uh, they decided that part of the problem was that, or a fundamental part of the problem was that children were attending very large public schools uh, that were uh, uh, not serving them well because they were disconnected from their community, uh, that the teachers didn't understand the community, and they wanted to start a campaign to start smaller, to, for the district to open smaller schools that would be uh, closer, more closely tied to the communities in which uh, they lived. And so they started a small schools campaign within the public schools. So I'm not going to go in great detail about it, but I want to give you the sense that it's about, uh, the cycle involves relationship building, it involves becoming educated and knowledgeable actors, and then, you know, starting a campaign for action itself, uh, which they did in terms of demonstrating power, accountability. So they, they, uh, they organized within their congregations and around their schools and went and, and developed their plans and spoke to uh, at the school committee meetings and they did win the opening of three new schools that were going to be their model schools for what they were going to do. And then we have the sort of evaluation and reflection component which is I think very important. But uh, let me just say something about those uh, schools. I think I have to go back. Maybe. Um, yeah. What I found very interesting about this um, <clears throat> is when they got won the opening of the schools, they didn't stop. It wasn't like we're just going to we're just going to demand something. We're just going to win it, and now we're going to walk away. That wasn't the approach at all. We've won the, the opening of these schools. Now we're going to participate in the design of the schools themselves and the opening of these schools. So the design teams that were created had principals, had teachers, and had parents from the organizing group all involved together. And it wasn't, what, what I find I think so much so important about this, is that it wasn't just about how the school was going to be designed. It was a place where new relationships were going to form. I spend a lot of time looking at public schools, and I think one of the profound problems that we have in our public schools is that our teachers and our educators are disconnected from the communities in which they serve. I'm, I'm looking mostly at urban areas for this. And so these design teams were places where teachers and principals and parents could build a different kind of relationship with each other, could share their stories so that the parents could understand where these teachers who were coming from outside their communities were coming from. What was their personal story? Why were they there? And out of these relationships created a whole different kind of foundation for the school. So I visited one of these schools. Um, I think I've lost myself in my PowerPoint. So. Yeah, the Lucha Elementary School. And uh, I'm just going to share one story. I, I do a lot of work in public education, so I, I think about these issues a lot. Um, I, I came, uh, you may know that in many of our urban schools, uh, parents are not that involved uh, it, for, for a variety of reasons. They don't feel welcomed in the school. Uh, they are also, uh, in, in any case, there's a long, many issues here. So they invited me to come visit the school. It was, uh, it was an evening. Uh, this again was a, uh, over, a primarily low-income Latino serving school. It was an evening, they were having a meeting to write a, an application to be recognized as a distinguished school in California. So it was an application writing meeting. And it was a room about, actually about the size of this. I walk in, there's a hundred parents in the room, a hundred. And the principal comes rushing up to me and says, oh, I'm so sorry, I have to apologize. We have a very low turnout tonight for our, of parents for our meeting. There's, a, there's an event going on at the parish down the road and a lot of our parents are down there. And uh, that was a low turnout. And it was very interesting. The whole way they approached it was an organizing kind of way. They had all these different stations created and parents and teachers uh, were, were working together at the various stations to try to develop what was, what was going to be the highlights for their thing. And there were some very interesting things happened uh, during the meeting, at one point, a parent raised her hand and said, I object to this language that someone has put into this proposal. This language says the school has many activities in which it involves parents. That's wrong. 
we are the parents who organize the activities that involve ourselves in the school. But that's a, that's a fundamental shift, right? It, how you think about the institutions that are in your community. That they're not doing something to you. That they are your institutions in which you are engaged and you have ownership and you have a say and control over. And I think that is a, is a fundamental accomplishment of what this kind of organizing can do. And I can go on and tell you about the test scores and the other ways in which these schools are successful. That's very important. But it's important, it, it, it arises because of the kind of or ownership that people feel in their school and the kind of relationships in and around the school that have been created. And I would argue that these are the kinds of relationships that faith-based organizing or communities of faith can help create when they engage with others, with public schools, with teachers, with educators who might represent a variety of faiths or, or not of any faith and create something different in our public realm. Okay, so um, that's a little bit about what I think organizing can do to strengthen our democracy, a little bit about how it works. Um, I just wanted to, to say and I, I, a little bit, and we've heard I think in some profound ways about what it really means uh, for, for people of, of faith to do this work. Um, but I spent a lot of time interviewing and, and, and exploring that too. And I, these are just a few different photos of kind of uh, faith in action in different kinds of settings. Um, but um, we've talked about it, it being a way to uh, make people's faith real in the world. Uh, we've heard profoundly about that. Uh, it is also, I think, a way often to strengthen congregations because the organizing work is not just external to the world. I mean, the whole idea of building relationships and of building people's leadership, thought of in a very holistic kind of way, comes into the parish or into the congregation or into the mosque so that there are, there are new leaders who, who come forward as leaders of their parishes or their congregations as well as in the public world that these are not, it's not just about sending people out into the world, it's, bringing, it's about bringing the world also into the congregation. Um, and I think, and I was going to uh, emphasize this, I think it's also about uh, creating new kinds of relationships, opportunities for new kinds of relationships. And I, I just want to focus a little bit on cross-racial relationships. We do live in a society that is still profoundly segregated. And most Americans, profoundly, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our faith communities, as we're observing here today as well, uh, this is a fundamental structure of our society. How is that going to change? How is that? Is that ever going to change? No. How, <laughs> maybe it never will, all right. But if it's going to change, people have to take some intentional action to make a change. And I, I have, a, this is Tony Flayo, he's one of the first people, first people I met in, in Texas. He's a, he was on North Dallas, which is a fairly white, affluent part of Dallas. And he said, one of the most profound lessons that I've ever learned, and I use it in everything that I do now, and I learned it from the, the Industrial Arts Foundation culture, is that relationships are intentional and deliberate. Diverse relationships are not just going to happen to me. If I want them, I have to create them. And in some ways it's a simple quote, but it's a very profound one. And the question is how many people in our society are intentionally and deliberately trying to create different kinds of relationships? How many? Um, and that's what I think is, is so profoundly important about this vehicle, as it's been called, this opportunity that I think organizing brings to people. And when I've interviewed people about, you know, why are you, in, not just why are you involved in organizing, but why do you stay involved in organizing? And, you know, we talk about it makes my faith real in the world, um, but it's also creating, it's a different kind of life that I'm leading now because I'm doing this. I have different kinds of relationships, and I find those profoundly meaningful to me. How do we live a meaningful life in our society? Well, we, we as people of faith, people are engaging their faith in the world, that's meaningful, but it has to answer a personal meaning as well, I think, in terms of why, when I ask people, why do you stay involved? And so many people have told me that it's about the, the relationships that I have that are different, that I have in any other way in my life, 
and it's, and it's the meaning that I get because I, I believe that I'm working with other people to create the kind of change in our society that we need. So I'm just going to end, uh, I was going to spend a little bit longer on this. I think there's, there's, there's two things going on here. I call this the call to act. Um, we've heard it, we've, we've been hearing some mentions of this. I do believe that we, we are facing a very profound uh, crisis in social justice in our country right now. Uh, it's the result of 20 or 30 years of growing inequality, of entrenched racism. Um, a friend of mine finally said, you know, it's now okay to talk about inequality in the last year or something in this country, but with this trend has been going on for 40 years, right? 40 years of growing inequality. Um, this is uh, a little bit about the school to prison pipeline. I'm just wondering how many people have, have ever heard the term school to prison pipeline? Oh, okay, so it's, it's entered, the, it's entered the, the public discourse. Um, the first people to talk about it, we're talking about it as a school to jailhouse track in rural Mississippi, black communities in rural Mississippi in the late 90s, 1990s started talking about the school to jailhouse track. Nobody knew what they were talking about. Um, now it's better known. In any case, it's about um, harsh and racially inequitable school discipline practices so that we have pre-K children and kindergarten children being uh, suspended from school. And it's, and it's mostly, uh, it's typically black and Latino boys and students with, with special needs, although girls are also affected by it. Um, it's gotten to such a crisis that fully 75% of all black students in the state of Texas have been suspended in the last year, 75%. Um, if you're suspended from school, you are much more likely to drop out or end up being expelled. Um, uh, you're three times more likely. Um, if, you're, if you've been suspended before you've, you've hit middle school, then your, uh, your chances of, being, of dropping out of school are five or six times as likely. If you have dropped out of school, if you are no longer in school, um, your chances of ending up in the juvenile or criminal justice system are very high. So uh, if you are an African-American man in this country without a high school degree, the chances that you will end up in prison in your life are, are two-thirds, are 66%. Two-thirds of all black men in this country without a high school degree will end up in prison at some point in their life. One-third of them are in prison right now. So it's a profound, it, there, and there are, you may know there are a million African-Americans imprisoned in, in this country or in the criminal justice system right now. So um, I could go on about this, but I, I believe that it's a profound crisis. I think the youth, uh, youth of color in our, in our society are at the epicenter of this crisis. Um, even after all of the years of struggle, 50% of black children grow up in or near poverty in this country. So uh, these things are all related. It's a call for us to take action, uh, is what I'm trying to, to get at here. Um, And the last part uh, I wanted to say is that it's also, I think, an invitation to take action. Because uh, the call uh, for social justice is, a, is an important call, um, but it also has to be, uh, a, the invitation has to be a personal one, I've learned through the world of organizing, that we have to reach out one-on-one -on -one with people and engage people around their own stories. Um, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time uh, interviewing white Americans who had become committed to the cause of racial justice, so very highly related to the issues of organizing. I interviewed 50 of these people and I tried to understand what really brought them to the work and what really kept them to the work. And, you know, I, I ended up with this little head, hand, and heart kind of diagram. You know, what I, not, not a single person said to me, I read about racism in a book and decided I needed to do something. <laughs> nobody said that, right? And nobody even said, well, someone like Mark Warren stood up and said, we're facing a profound social justice crisis and I decided to do something about it, okay? That's important, all right? The books need to be written. I need to stand up and say that, right? That's part of the process, but that's pretty helpful at informing people along the way about what they might do about it to change it. We need to study the school to prison pipeline if we're going to change it, but it's not really what brings people to change it in the first place or what keeps them in. And what I did find in short was it was very much about people's values. It was about their faith beliefs or other values that got them started in a way. But then it was really building the relationships while they took action. That they, they, they took a step. They didn't really know where this step was going to go for sure. Right? They were willing to take the first step 
to meet some people who were different from them, to get into a setting that was maybe challenging for them, to go to a different part of a metro area that they'd never been to, to create a different, it was that risk, if you, if you want to look at it that way, that created a new kinds of relationships for them. And it was really those relationships and that community of, of people of faith who were engaged in the work that really kept them going. Uh, the head part was important, knowledge was important uh, about what to do, but really what, what brought people to do it was uh, their values, what pe kept people do going were the relationships, and in the end, what people told me was that they found this, was a, this created for them a very meaningful life. This was the life that they actually wanted to lead because they were creating, they were working to create the kind of society in which they would like their children to live. And through working together with people across faith and racial and class lines, we were, we were attempting to model that society in our own lives, as broken as it might be. And it was the attempt to, to model that society, to build that kind of society, both out there in the public world and in here in our own lives, that really kept people um, in this kind of work in the long run. So thank you very much. Thanks again for inviting me to come.